Hello and welcome to The Steward, MST's podcast exploring all things antimicrobial stewardship and infection control. I'm Mark Johnson, Associate Director of Policy and Communications at MSD, and each episode I'll be talking to a different expert on their experience of antimicrobial resistance and how we can translate this into effective antibiotic stewardship here in the UK. A reminder, all contributions by experts invited onto this show, be this comments, factual claims or otherwise, are grounded in their own personal experiences, have not been influenced by MSD, and nor indeed do they represent the views of MSD. That said, we couldn't be more delighted to have them here with us to discuss this incredibly important field of medicine. So, without further ado, let's meet today's guest. Okay, everyone, hello, and welcome to episode three of MSD's The Steward. So far in this series, we've focused quite rightly on the impact that drug resistant infections can have on patients themselves and the work of charities in this area, like the UK Sepsis Trust and Antibiotic Research UK. Now, however, we're really keen to get stuck in and hear firsthand how experts are tackling these infections on the ground, at the coalface, as it were, of this never-ending battle against antimicrobial resistance, otherwise known as AMR. Now, one thing we're also really keen to do in this series is explore as many different regions of the UK as possible, highlighting where we can notable successes, but also indeed the challenges that may be unique to different geographies. So with an eye to doing just this, it brings me great pleasure to welcome today's guest. So Aaron, it's over to you. Please feel free to introduce yourself and the organisation that you work for. Hello, Mark. Uh, thank you for your kind invitation to speak. Um, my name is Aaron Brady. Um, I'm an antimicrobial pharmacist in Belfast Health and Social Care Trust. And I'm also a visiting research fellow at Queen's University Belfast. So that's my my day to day jobs, as it were. Excellent. And uh, <clears throat> it's an absolute enormous pleasure to have you here with us today to discuss antimicrobial stewardship, otherwise known as AMS, um, a key tool in the fight against AMR. Um, there would be lots of acronyms, so please, for the listeners' benefit, please explain any if you think uh, they need to be explained. Mm -hmm. um, but we're here to talk about AMS, as I said, and um, one thing I've asked the previous uh, participants on this uh, series is to define what they think AMS, antimicrobial stewardship, is. Now, it's a pers personal passion of yours. It's part of your, your day job. But let's start there. Could you potentially give us a, your definition of what you think AMS is? Well, I think at its most basic, antimicrobial stewardship is about using antimicrobials responsibly. Um, it's quite hard to break it down, I suppose, into one phrase. And it that's just demonstrated by the fact that in different countries, even there are different terms. So it's in France, it's a program yeah. of good antibiotic use. In Germany, it's a strategy of national use. Um, well, I suppose from a pragmatic point of view, the one that I personally like is the one from uh, BSAC because it outlines a practical mm. approach so and that's the British Society for Society. Antimicrobial oh, sorry, Chemotherapy. Yes. British, uh, yeah. yes, of a British Society of Antimicrobial Chemotherapy, as it outlines a practical approach insofar as it talks about using the right antibiotic for the right indication, the right patient, the right time, right route, and also, very importantly, causing the least harm to the patient and future patients. Um, because I suppose antimicrobials probably almost exclusively are the only class of drugs with potential clinical impact on both the individual and wider individuals mm -hmm. through the potential for resistance to develop. I think that's a, that's a really neat definition, uh, Aaron, a, re a really good one. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about AMS um, and in particular how you yourself contribute in this space. But um, I think one thing we're, we're keen to start with is is um, I always like to hear from, the, from a personal uh, front first. What is it that sparked your interest in AMS? And I think if you could kind of use that as a segue into introducing your role and, and, and what you do um, would be great. Um, well, I started my clinical training after uh, university at King's College Hospital in London. Um, and I went on to hold a post as a specialist pharmacist on King's College Hospital's renal unit, which is a very large unit um, profile across Europe. Um, 
it was while I was there and in that post that I really first became interested in, in microbiology and stewardship, um, really in part due to the large numbers of patients that, that we would see who required antimicrobial treatment for multiple infections such as peritonitis with peritoneal mm -hmm. dialysis, Lyme infections, obviously post-transplant immunosuppressed individuals requiring treatment for infections. And that just really took hold, that interest. And not long after that, I decided to apply for um, a PhD in, in Queen's University, Belfast, um, looking at antimicrobial susceptibility of difficult to treat bugs, often growing in biofilm. Mm -hmm. So people would often ask me, what's your PhD in? And I would just say, bugs and drugs, bugs and drugs, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> um, so that's really what um, stimulated my interest. And after my PhD in a short period of uh, held a lecture position for a year, I returned to the NHS and started working as a critical care pharmacist. So once again, I was immediately exposed to um, patients in extremis, mm. often on multiple antibiotic therapies. Um, so that's really the, the genesis of my interest in stewardship. Right, and obviously um, an extensive background and experience in the field. So I guess kind of segueing, as I said, into where you are today, um, could you give our listeners kind of a brief description of your day-to-day -day responsibilities and how you yourself contribute to leading AMS efforts in Northern Ireland? Well, I suppose my day-to-day -day role, um, because I'm jointly between the NHS and uh, Queen's University from academia, um, my joint role will, will be looking at policies, improving antimicrobial stewardship policies, taking into account antimicrobial resistance, looking at new initiatives, looking working with technology as a major initiative, um, which we are keen to embrace. We also do a lot of number crunching um, regarding data because public health, I know over in England, for public health and fingertips is sort of the uh, mechanism of sharing um, antimicrobial resistance data and consumption data. Mm -hmm. So we um, would <clears throat> think, sorry, again, for the benefit of listeners, fingertips is the portal, isn't it, that uh, Public Health England uses to publish a variety of data relating to antimicrobial resistance. Mm -hmm. And we would have a similar setup here and we are able to scrutinize the usage of all of the different classes of antibiotics, different types of infections. And following on from the O'Neill report, that's really where it's at as, as much as anything. Mm -hmm. as obviously we're using too, too many antibiotics of too many different classes. So we've been all set targets to try and reduce the consumption because basic science will tell you that consumption drives resistance and we yep. want to retain the antibiotics we have because I don't know what is it there's only about 40 in the pipeline wor worldwide so it's a it's a vanishingly scarce resource mm. yeah so I think you, you know you're, you're touching on um the practical side of stewardship and the decision making in the hospital. Now, that's not actually something that we've we've covered yet in this series. But I think um, listeners to the first two podcasts, if they've persevered this far, I think they'd like to to know that actually and how this this theory around stewardship works in practice. So, um, you yourself have extensive experience in in the hospital setting. And whilst we're not so much going to talk about the primary care, the GP setting, um, at least in the hospital, how are these decisions usually taken you know i think we all acknowledge don't we that antimicrobial responsible use is all our concern um 
but there are specific responsibilities and duties of doctors within the hospital. So how does that usually take shape and, and who leads those efforts within a hospital? So regarding how decisions are taken in a hospital, uh, I think it's good to contrast what happened from when I first qualified to how the process works now. So when I worked in King's in the late 90s and early 2000s, each specialty very much had their own protocol and guidelines. Right. Um, there would obviously be input from microbiology, but specialties by and large were, were independent and there wasn't an adherence to a sort of overarching approach. But then, then gradually with the realisation that antimicrobial resistance was a major issue and the Department of Health, Healthcare Trusts, realised that they had to sort of formalise and give structure to their policies and guidelines with sort of mm -hmm. the focus very much on evidence-based medicine and meeting targets, so patient outcomes, um, healthcare acquired infections, education and training. Um, so it was from then to now, it's very much formalised. Um, I can't really speak, I suppose, for England, Scotland or Wales, but across Northern Ireland now, it's a fairly similar structure and approach to um, stewardship and secondary care. So, for instance, I'm on the Belfast Trust Antimicrobial Stewardship Working Group, which oversees work streams, projects directly concerned with antimicrobial stewardship. Mm -hmm. um, myself and my pharmacy colleagues, along with a range of other groups, so infection control, medical, surgical specialties, nursing, we would then all report to an antimicrobial steering committee, which then has overall responsibility for all things antimicrobial within the trust, so policies, guidelines. And then as a final step, sort of to ensure due diligence um, yeah. All new and updated policies are then presented to what's known as the Drug and Therapeutics Committee, and they would approve its use within the trust for the yeah. set out indications. So I suppose to answer your question, it's very much a case of each group being responsible for their own work stream, but reporting the progress, presenting this to multidisciplinary forum which personally I think the multidisciplinary engagement is very important, especially Definitely. a very large organisation such as the Belfast Trust, just because we need to lose the silo mentality and we need to be mm. transparent to all our colleagues. So I think what you mentioned there is really important to kind of uh, juxtaposition the past versus the present and the movement toward, as you say, more multidisciplinary team team working, which appears to be a running theme when we talk to experts as a critical mm -hmm. success factor for, for good AMS. Um, I think, yeah, you know, you mentioned some of the policies earlier on that have emerged over the, the last few years. Um, uh, listeners may or may not be aware that the UK uh, has had several iterations of a nationwide national action plan to tackle AMR and indeed now has a 20-year vision to tackle AMR as well, which mm -hmm. is fantastic. Yeah. And the UK as a whole has generally been recognised as a leader in this space. Um, but then beneath that, you've got sitting within the devolved administrations of Northern Ireland, Wales and Scotland, you've then got um, more bespoke plans that I guess run in parallel or sit, sit beneath or complement the wider UK strategy. Um, but I'd be really keen on your thoughts, Aaron, as to um, the relevance of the UK nationwide one versus Northern Ireland's bespoke changing the culture one health, I believe it's called, action plan, um, and whether there are any unique challenges, I guess, as a next question within Northern Ireland that, that perhaps mark it out as being particularly challenging or, or indeed, I guess, whether there's any issues specific to Northern Ireland that, that people such as yourself have to account for when seeking to promote good AMS practices. A big question. So yes, I'll just, gonna, I'll, just, I'll just sort of maybe just even sort of slightly break it down. Um, so yes, the UK's five-year national action plan 
a collective joined up approach can only aid in the tackling of AMR, obviously. Um, and then the main topic or the main agendas in the O'Neill report were reducing an unnecessary antimicrobial use, optimizing their use, and investing in innovation. Now, if you've read the One Health Action Plan, the three main objectives in the One Health document are the same as those in the UK plan. Indeed. So in reality, it's the same objectives outlined in the UK plan, but with actions specific to Northern Ireland. Yeah. So, But that only makes sense because goals really should be universal. It would be it would be strange if there was a fragmentation of goals across um, areas so geographically close. Indeed. Regarding, they're Indeed. both op they're they're both optimistic documents um, in their reach. So, a fifty percent reduction in gram negative bloodstream infections by twenty three twenty four. But I suppose when you're tackling a global challenge such as antimicrobial resistance, I think an optimistic reach is probably appropriate. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, uh, apologies for pressing on this question, but I'm, I'm keen to know, and there may be that there aren't any, but are there any specific challenges that exist within Northern Ireland um, that you think have resulted in you needing to adopt maybe slightly different or, or um, bespoke approaches to AMS? Now, this could relate to anything. So it could be to do with the prevalence of certain pathogens, could be the use of certain technologies. I, I don't know. But, you know, as I said at the beginning, one of the things we're really keen to tease out is some of the kind of geographic variations, which mm -hmm. in some cases might actually be warranted. Um, well, just as a disclaimer, it's absolute, absolutely not my area of expertise. But I would strongly expect that Northern Ireland has a significantly higher percentage of the population per capita involved in agriculture than most parts of the UK. Um, we're relatively small population-wide, but there's a lot of that population who are involved in agriculture. And from that, basic science would say that due to the large amounts of antibiotics used in agriculture within a smaller population, there's potentially a greater driver for development of antimicrobial resistance in Northern Ireland compared to the rest of the UK. If I had to hang my hat on, on one concept, it would probably be, be that. No, I think that's a really interesting answer, Aaron. And given that the Northern Ireland plan, indeed, in the title includes that phrase, One Health, which again, for the benefit of listeners, is this idea that we tackle AMR from all fronts, so not just from a human health, but also from an animal health perspective and an environmental perspective as well, because drivers of resistance come through all three three strands. I think it's really interesting that given that, you've just mentioned an example of something that relates to agriculture. So I think that moves us on to a, a similar related question, which is, again, if we could shift our minds back into the human health side. Um, in respect to your own personal research interests, is there anything that you wanted to add on that front? Uh, yes, Mark. I still keep on a, a, a visiting research post in Queen's University, Belfast, and from a research point of view, there's, there's two main pieces that are in progress for me at the present time. Mm -hmm. um, the first is a piece of work with one of our trainee surgeons, which is looking at infections following upper GI surgeries, such as esophagectomies, and looking at the bugs that are implicated. Um, so what this is really aimed at is a view to suggesting a more personalized surgical prophylaxis treatment based on pre-operative cultures and sensitivities so that we're not giving all of the patients a cookie cutter surgical prophylactic guideline. Okay. We're trying to tailor it to each individual patient so that 30 days down the line post-op, they're not still in intensive care with the post-op infection, which we could have possibly picked up before the operation was undertaken.
That's really interesting, Aaron. Have you are you aware of uh, any other efforts elsewhere to take on that more tailored approach to surgical prophylactic use of antibiotics, or does it tend to be more uniform uh, guidelines? Well, it tends to look overarchingly at the bugs which are present in the overall surgical population for that surgery and therefore uses the most appropriate antibiotic to cover the greatest percentage of bugs. Mm -hmm. But that's different from tailoring it to an individual patient. So each indi individual patient may have a different antimicrobial flora. And if we can tailor their surgical prophylaxis to a treatment based on that, mm -hmm. well, we would expect to see less problems due to post-operative infection 30 days down the line. And there's also the added benefit of in patients who are undergoing <clears throat> surgery such as this, they can very easily spend 20, 30 days in an, an intensive care unit. Now, we're not saying that money is the driver of everything, but each night in an intensive care unit is close to £2,000. So anything we can shave off those to improve mortality, morbidity, mm -hmm. to, to save finances, to reinvest an area in other areas can only be a good thing. That's really, really interesting, Aaron. I have to say it's the, um, it's, it's the first I've heard of, of something like that. Uh, could we get an expectation on potential readouts or is, that, is it too early to say in terms of timings? Well, I haven't, I, I, I've just been working through with the trainee, the outlining how the paper should be done because she had never written an academic paper before. So it's been kind of a learning curve. But the other thing is we're doing it all via email and Zoom meetings. Of course. So it, it probably takes about 10 times as long. But <laughs> um, I'll send you the draft, don't worry. <laughs> I just want to touch on another one, um, which it's a project which, which will hopefully involve colleagues from uh, our, the Queen's University School of Pharmacy and Medicine. And okay. it's aiming to look at penetration of antibiotics into the cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis lungs. So and the plan is to fund a PhD student who will use things like HPLC, mass spectrometry. Those are simply means of detecting small concentrations of drugs to detect the concentration of both an intravenous and inhaled antibiotics. Mm -hmm. So the basis of this is that we, we have data from licensing trials on how various drugs, antibiotics, penetrate into the healthy lung. But in the cystic fibrosis, bronchiectasis lung, it's very different. It's a much more mucoid environment. It's sticky and there's there's multiple bugs living mm -hmm. in all of that mucus known as a biofilm. And in all likelihood, we require higher antibiotic concentrations to kill those bugs. So what we would really like to know is how much of the drug that we're giving to the patient actually gets to treat the bugs in the lungs of cystic fibrosis and bronchiectasis patients. So that's hopefully some research work and that will be hopefully done by a PhD student. Um, so I'd be very hopeful of that, producing some significant mm -hmm. outcomes. <clears throat> Again, very interesting. So again, the, the hypothesis, I assume, therefore being the more accurately we can determine the extent to which the right concentration is reaching the right location within these patients' lungs, the more likely we'll have a successful patient outcome. Yes, again, and again, it all it comes back to sort of the definition of antimicrobial stewardship, the right drug, the right route, the right dose, mm -hmm. right duration. So again, that just regresses back to first principles. Absolutely. Um, the thing about Northern Ireland, even though it's small geographically, that actually can be quite beneficial because we can sort of harmonise our approaches and 
I know across Northern Ireland, we're all doing work to progress things like the ARC Cardex, the antimicrobial resistance kit Cardex, which is um, a three-day Cardex, and then you review that antibiotic treat treatment. Okay. Also, OPAT, outpatient um, uh, antimicrobial treatment, um, and also development of a regional Cardex. But regarding specifics, there was some excellent published research last year by what is known as the Medicines Optimization and Innovation Centre in the Northern Trust, which looked at antibiotics use and rates of resistance. And that was published in Nature Microbiology. So um, it's a, a very good standard. Um, so what it challenged was the existing paradigm of increased antibiotic use having a linear relationship with resistance. So okay. accordingly, you use more and there's a proportional increase in resistance. What it found with using quite a lot of mathematical modeling, which and it found that the suggestion that the resistance is non-linear and that the resistance only develops once you exceed a certain threshold of use of a particular antibiotic. Interesting. So it's sort of changed the the landscape a bit in that regard. Um, and it may do going into the future as well. Um, there's also innovations such as the new outpatient parental antimicrobial treatment service developed with the Department of Health's transformational funding. Um, and that has significantly reduced hospital admissions, improved patient outcomes. Um, when I say improved, drastically readmission rates reduced by over 50 percent so Aaron that's a that's a really key one and actually you know that's something we're looking to deep dive potentially in a future episode but again mm -hmm. um I think uh, you've highlighted a really tangible concrete example there could you just dive a little bit deeper into the concept of what OPAT is because I'm I'm keen that um for many listeners that that will be an mm -hmm. entirely new concept so you mentioned reductions in hospital stay so so what is outpatient antimicrobial therapy. It, yes, and it's typically um, intravenous antimicrobial therapy. I think that's important to add. It's not a home having an oral course of antibiotics. Um, well, quite often, patients are identified in secondary care who are suitable candidates to receive their antimicrobial therapy intravenously at home. Now, that is the added benefit of allowing the patients to stay at home, not causing mm -hmm. or resulting in a hospital admission, less exposure to potentially other pathogens for the patient. But it, it tends to be only in a certain section of infection. So quite often skin and soft tissue infections, um, infections of the bone, and these would be more applicable for people who require courses, anything up to like six to eight weeks of intravenous antimicrobial therapy. Mm. I suppose one of the rate limiting steps is there has to be at the moment um, input from district nursing to set that up. Sure. And administer the antimicrobials in the patients at home. And that would probably be our limiting step at the moment. However, it's definitely an avenue which will gain traction in the future because it has <clears throat> so it has so many pros and virtually no cons. Well, again, no thanks, Aaron. I think that's a really uh, as I said, tangible, concrete example. And what you've just said there about nurses in the community helping with to deliver this service, it kind of touches again, doesn't it, on your point around the importance of multidisciplinary team working mm -hmm. when it comes to good AMS Absolutely. principles. Um, and I guess one other example that I'm, I'm aware of, perhaps you're too modest to raise yourself, but you know, you do take quite an active role, don't you, when it comes to sort of the annual November World Antibiotic Awareness Week type activities. Um, indeed, I know you have previously been involved in some in, in Northern Ireland, so I don't know if that's something else you wanted to, to touch on as well. I, 
Uh, <laughs> well, oh yes, I suppose closer to home in, in Belfast Trust. Um, last year we decided to, to go for a bit a bit more ambitious project to coincide with World Antibiotic Awareness Week. Um, so in addition to the existing sort of poster displays, e-learning, um, we decided to host a one-day symposium titled From Stewardship to Sepsis. So mm -hmm. this was a free-to-attend event with CPD accreditation from the Royal College of Anaesthetists. I'm, I'm sure that that was a combination factor in its success as well, being free and giving C CPD. But um, we had speakers from King's College London, the Royal Marsden, Belfast Trust and Queen's University, all highlighting current antimicrobial stewardship challenges in both clinical practice and academia. So it's, it was a, I'm happy to report it was, it was a sold out event. It was attended. Amazing. Excellent. There were 120 pharmacists, medics, nurses, mm -hmm. biomedical scientists. And the plan is for it to be a recurring event, COVID permitting. Indeed. Indeed. Um, so it may not we may not be holding it in November this year, but the plan is for next March. Okay, okay. Um, so I think that is a natural, uh, albeit somewhat unplanned segue into into my next question, um, which is, I guess, with the previous two episodes, we've had to do this as well because it's only right and proper that we do, and that's to acknowledge the very strange times in which we are currently recording mm -hmm. this this mm -hmm. episode, um, and acknowledge the the global pandemic that's, that's currently going on. Now, not to get too deeply into this, as this is obviously a, a global issue, but. Um, AMS is still really, really important right now. And I know you yourself um, have and are um, uh, uh, helping uh, meet the needs of these patients with, that are suffering from, from COVID-19. Um, so in respect to that and how that's impacted on the hospitals, on your, on your personal role, I wonder if there's a few things you'd like to share with us in terms of the experience of COVID-19 and how that's impacting on, on AMS. Yeah, that's yeah. good. That's a good question, Mark. Um, I think everyone, like, I think like everyone in the NHS, COVID dramatically altered the landscape almost overnight. Um, sure. My own, my own base hospital, the Belfast City Hospital, was de designated a Nightingale Hospital and I was actually seconded to work in the COVID ICU as a critical care phar pharmacist. And it's really only been in the last month, if that, the things have returned to something approaching normal. I think we're all waiting for the dust to settle. But as with everywhere, antimicrobial stewardship had to take something of a back seat, really, to the immediate challenge of COVID. Um, and that was just the reality of the situation for for several months there. Well, I think that's com completely understandable, isn't it? Um, yeah, the, we. I was still on the on the ICU, scrutinising the antimicrobial usage every day and advising. Um, but the overarching policies that we were developing trust wide, they had to be put on pause. So there was still ward based stewardship going on. But the things which we were hoping to progress, the work streams which we had planned, they all had to be put on pause until they could be revisited. Sure. And I guess you've got the two, there's two conflicting issues, isn't there, which I think um, listeners um, might be interested in being made aware of, which is um, you've obviously got a lot of precautionary use of antibiotics going on within hospitals during this period of, of huge uncertainty with, with COVID-19. Um, but equally, that increase in usage, as you said earlier, any increase in consumption is, is we know, what we do know for sure is that increased consumption raises the risk of, of new resistance emerging to antibiotics. So there's this kind of um, really, I guess it's like a tightrope, isn't it, that people have to constantly walk between um, being precautionary and trying to protect patients on the one hand versus protecting the population from downstream events that might occur in future, like the emergence of, of, of new strains of resistance. So it's a really, really tough, tough call for, for doctors to make. 
Yeah, it's um, and even like we uh, we haven't been able to analyze our public health consumption data as of yet. But speaking to colleagues in the Royal Pharmaceutical Society's expert advisory group, I know that mm -hmm. in mainland UK there was um, a considerable increase in antimicrobial use in the COVID period, and then unsurprisingly, an increase in C diff over the COVID period. Right. So, as as you're alluding to, those things just uh, just go hand in hand. So, do you think things are beginning, at least in terms of locally for you, Aaron? Are things beginning to um, get a little bit back to normal when it comes to application of AMS principles? Um, uh, and are there any any learnings about this experience that that might help with future application of AMS principles? Yeah, well, things over the last month have started to sort of get going again. And then mm -hmm. they've been somewhat hampered then by the fact that it's summer and things are a bit askew for that. So we've been restarting all our work streams and um, getting to grips with a sort of three month backlog of things which we have to address. Um, so it'll take a bit of time to regain the momentum that we had. But I think what we have learned, again, you've mentioned it earlier, that the multidisciplinary working and is crucial. Mm. And we need to get away from maybe a historic silo mentality where we all looked after our own niche. We're all, I, I, I don't really like the phrase of, but we're all kind of in this together as far as <laughs> sure. stewardship yeah. and resistance because, you know, as the O'Neill report rightly highlighted, um, there's a there could be a sort of a time of reckoning when it's too late to do something about it. So we need we need to do something now. Indeed, and and we've spoken. Um... Uh, at, at some length in, with previous episodes with respect to the, those figures that you mentioned and the potential cost for all of us of getting this wrong, frankly. But um, I'm really pleased to hear that you think things are starting to get back to um, some level of norm, at least. Um, and I pray that continues as, as the weeks and months go on. Um, so I think the one of the final topics I wanted to pick up with you, Aaron, was the uh, I think your your personal research interest, to be honest, um, or personal interest more generally when it comes to AMS and your hopes for the future. So there's lots of, despite these, you know, worrying statistics about what we could be facing down the line, I think there is some cause for optimism and there's various developments um, at play, be these in the field of technology and diagnostics, be it, you know, adoption of new systems that better capture resistance data and make it more freely available to treating clinicians. Um, the area of new innovations is something which we're, we're leaving for a future episode, I, I believe. But there are there are um, green shoots, shall I shall I say? Um, mm -hmm. So is there any any what, what are your hopes for the future? And, and if you had to focus um, minds in any particular direction, would there be any specific part of the uh, AMS ecosystem where you would where you'd want to point people to? Well, I think from a policy level, we need a greater recognition that research should be up front and center mm -hmm. as, as a priority. We also need to make that research inclusive. So that is talking about the NHS, it's called, talking about academia, it's talking about public health, it's talking about industry. Yep. So if we make everyone have the requisite knowledge, well, that can only be a good thing. Obviously, there has to be checks and balances in place and confidentiality and stuff like that, but um, it can only be a, a, a better outcome if we collaborate together. Absolutely. I think, I think there is no... There's no breakthrough which just happens like Alexander Fleming, where fortuitously a mould lands on an agar plate. Those days just they don't those things don't happen in research. 
research progresses incrementally due to collaboration. And I think policymakers need to bear that in mind and need to enshrine that in their policies. Mm-hmm. Mm. I, I I wholeheartedly agree, Aaron. And, um, uh, you know, one of the things that just came to my mind as you were talking there was that, and I know this, this again goes back to uh, London Westminster side, which I guess we're, we're not focusing on in this episode. But one thing I can't help but remember is that the Health and Social Care Committee of the UK Parliament, when they held their inquiry into antimicrobial resistance a couple of years ago, one of their key findings and recommendations was that for the UK government as a whole, that AMR should be considered a top five policy priority amongst everything that they have Mm -hmm. on their plate. And I think your ask there about research and and that research in AMR and AMS needs to be prioritised can only happen if... AMR, AMS more generally, is indeed considered a top five policy priority for for governments. Um, So that's something which I really hope does uh, does come to fruition. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think, to be honest, I think you have provided numerous really, I've, I've, I've really enjoyed the conversation. You provided numerous concrete examples of the work that you and others are doing in Northern Ireland. I think before we close out the episode, I must ask if there's anything else that you wanted to raise because you've raised several spontaneous things, which I wasn't expecting, but it's been a delight to hear. Um, let me think. Well, I suppose um, it's, as, as much as anything, the, the role of the clinical pharmacist and how it has developed in recent years, um, mm-hmm. I, th- I think, from my point of view, obviously, it's vested interest. I, th- I think clinical <laughs> pharmacists and pharmacists in general have always had tremendous expertise, whether it be pharmacology, bioavailability, drug dosing, dr- drug interactions. Um, and that is a particular knowledge set that most other clinicians don't have in depth mm-hmm. knowledge of. So it allows clinical pharmacy to make a really important contribution to patient care. Um, So I think that's the niche and the the important niche that clinical pharmacy and by extension antimicrobial pharmacy occupies. And I often find myself in a position where I'm between, for instance, a a specialist and a microbiologist. And clinical pharmacy in tends to operate as a Venn diagram across both of those so that we need to have a very good working knowledge of the microbiology, but also the wider clinical picture. Um, So that's one of the things that I really think that clinical pharmacy can bring to improved patient outcome and patient care. Again, really good point, Aaron. So you're effectively saying quite rightly that clinical pharmacy side, you're effectively acting as a linchpin between and, and a, a, a key component of that multidisciplinary team that you mentioned. Mm-hmm. Um, microbiologists are incredibly essential to that team, as are the treating physicians, but um, there's always a need for more people like yourself who are I was about to use the phrase caught in the middle, but it's not a conflict. Yeah, yes, I know what you mean. <laughs> yeah. And there's really, I don't, there should, there's no ownership over knowledge. To my mind, um, we should, to improve patient outcome and improve patient care, we should seek to be as knowledgeable as possible and to share that knowledge as widely, as broadly as we can, so that it can benefit everyone. Absolutely. And um, I think you've just ended the episode better than I could, Aaron. <laughs> That's exactly what we're trying to do through this series. Yes, indeed, indeed. So, Aaron, listen, thank you on, on behalf of everyone at MSD and the listeners listening to this episode. Thank you for all your contributions. It's been an absolute delight to hear how AMS principles are being applied in Northern Ireland and indeed your your hopes for the future, which, which I echo a, a thousand times over. So, again, thank you for the last time. Thank you to our listeners, and I look forward to you joining us next time. Thank you. I'm Mark Johnson, and you've been listening to The Stewards, brought to you by MSD. 
Thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you next time.